Okay, where are we at, folks? Where are we at in the Bible? Mark 5. Mark 5, very good. I can see that, I can see that you're all awake. <laughs> Terry especially. <laughs> We're just about ready to finish Mark 5. It's been a glorious chapter. Uh, certainly the main message is Jesus is Lord, he is God no less than God, which is a very, very important message. For only God can save us. And he is the one who determines our uh, life now and forever. And it's a good message that he has sent us, uh, that Jesus is God. He has come to save us. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he has saved us. And just as he gives healing to these people and raises them from the dead that we're reading about here. Uh, As he calms storms, he he is powerful to save. And uh, we can put all our trust in him, knowing that he will fulfill all his promises to us. So uh, let's just review very quickly verse 42. You know where we're at here. Uh, This is Jairus' daughter, and uh, she has died. And Jesus uh, has said to her in verse 41, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. It's really in the form of a command. And just as he will say to all people on the last day when he comes again, he will tell all people to arise. And they will arise in their bodies just as she did. Verse 42, and straightway, immediately, the damsel, the 12-year-old, arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Okay, so the girl obeys Jesus' command. She does exactly what Jesus says. Uh, Nobody can resist Jesus' call to rise from the dead just as nobody will be able to resist that on the last day. All people, whether they believed in Jesus or not, will be forced by God to arise, to come back, or as we've seen in Luke, her spirit came back into her. So it will be with all people at the end of the world. They will arise. And uh, body and soul, they will be judged by Jesus. And... uh, Those who had faith in him as their God and Savior who believed the Bible will be at his right hand and be welcomed into eternal life in heaven, body, and soul. And those who did not have faith in him but rejected him will be cast into hell fire with the devil. Okay, so... uh, There's no doubt that the girl was dead. She wasn't just sleeping in human terms. But Jesus, God, can raise her up as if she was just sleeping in his eyes. She was dead. Her spirit had left her. Her soul had left her. And Jesus commands it to come back in. And then after that, she walked. Uh, what What a nice detail that is, told by the eyewitness Peter here. Uh... And she is perfectly normal. She's able to walk, which she could not do before she died. She was uh, in her deathbed, you might say. But now she's walking around the house. And then we have this detail. She was of the age of 12. She's now acting like any normal 12-year-old. In other words, she's totally normal. All traces of the disease that had caused her death had been healed. And how did Jesus do this? With a word, simply a word in verse 41. Uh, Talitha kumai. Uh, That's all. He didn't call upon God because he is God. And his word is enough to defeat the greatest foe we have, death. Uh, The greatest weapon in the hands of Satan as we have up there on the board. He he defeats it very easily. His word expresses his almighty will. 
Uh, so he's defeated Satan again. Satan brought death into the world, and we've seen him defeat Satan all throughout Mark so far, uh, casting out demons out of possessed people. And here again he defeats Satan. Uh, there's no contest. Uh, Satan is very powerful compared to human beings, but he is no match for God. And uh, Jesus shows that again here. The result at the end of verse 42, they, people who saw this and uh, saw the girl alive, they were astonished with a great astonishment because they had thought she was surely dead. And no one can come back to life after they're dead, so they think. So not just are they astonished, they are greatly astonished. And if they are honest with themselves, they're going to admit they are in the presence of God. Only God could do this. And I'm sure that if, if you go out to a cemetery and somebody comes up out of the grave, you'll know that God did it. That only God could do that. No one else. Uh, so, they were astonished at Jesus. Well, we too are astonished at Jesus, aren't we? That's why we're here today. Uh, we believe these accounts that uh, have been recorded to us down through the centuries uh, by the apostles and prophets. But these are truths. This actually happened. This isn't some kind of a fairy tale. Uh, we believe this truth. And therefore, we are astonished too. And we should rightly be. For this is no less than our creator, the one who holds the whole universe in his hand, who has come in the form of the man Jesus. And we would all be astonished if we saw this. If we went to a funeral one day, and, or, uh, uh, you know, whatever they have now for funerals, <laughs> Uh, whether the whether the person's body be burned to ashes in an urn, or whether their body be in a coffin, and all of a sudden it came back to life and started talking to us and walking around, we'd be astonished. Let's face it. We'd be astonished beyond words. We'd be greatly astonished, and we would have to say, this is God's doing. God is at work among us. This is the greatest of all miracles, the resurrection. And that is the main proving point of Christianity, the main proving point of the Bible. We, mar we marvel at, at modern medicine, what it can do, but it's nothing like this. We've seen Jesus do already in the first five chapters of Mark things far beyond what modern medicine can even do. And if we marvel at modern medicine, we should surely marvel at Jesus. There's no comparison. Absolutely no comparison. And all that is because of God anyway. All that's modern. That's right. You know, God has allowed man to discover certain things in his creation. Uh, whether it be in terms of medicine or in the field of electronics. Uh, what electricity can do. Uh, or in the field of any other endeavor of man. This is all God allowing us to do it. And you know why I think he allows us to discover these things? For the spreading of his word. So that his word can go forth into all the world, as Jesus said it would. Uh, you know, just 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, Christians could have could have wondered, how, how, how can the word of God go into the whole world? I mean, we're sending missionaries out on steamships to Africa and India and China and uh, so forth, but how, how can we reach all these people with the word of God? Now we know, because God has allowed man to discover electronics and the internet
That's right. And everything in the world is that way. Uh, God can use it for good, but man and Satan can use it for evil. Everything uh, is that way. But there's a lot more. That's right. There's a lot more distraction, but there is also more Bible reading today than there was in Luther's day. So you know, the, the printing press was a great uh, advance that God gave the world to uh, to spread His word. Imagine if uh, it was still like that today, where all they had was handwritten, hand copied Bibles. So, uh, no, God's at work, but yes, man can use any of his inventions to also work evil. But I think it's just amazing that uh, you can pick up your device, your iPhone, your pad, go to your computer, wherever, you know, you, huh? Right, right in your hand. You got the Bible right there. And you can, in fact, I think you do, in Bible class and in worship. You, you can pull up a Bible verse just like that in, in, in 10 different languages, or I mean 10 different translations. And you were asking what time for a verse to locate it, and I just did a search, and I said, there it is. That's right, yeah, yeah. I think that's amazing. And that's God's work. That's within the last, what, five to 10 years that we really had something. That's right, like that. that's right. Uh-huh. Uh, so no, the Bible is more readily available now than ever in history. Yeah. yeah, there's always been evil, and as Jesus said, the evil will grow worse and worse as the end of the world comes, closer and closer. So no, that's going to happen too. They'll grow up together. Uh, all these things that God uses to uh, get the word of salvation out, the gospel, can also be used by Satan to work against the gospel. But it's always been that way. Yeah, the great struggle between God and Satan, yeah. Uh, I mean, you could take any invention of man, whether it be the wheel or fire, <laughs> which aren't really inventions, uh, but anything that God uh, has, has, has created and man has discovered uh, can be used either way, and man has used in his sinfulness is used for evil. Okay, any questions on verse 42 before we close with the last verse of this chapter, 43? Everybody ready? 43, and he, Jesus, charged them, anybody around uh, this, who's aware of this, straightly, that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Okay, so Jesus charged them straightly. Straightly means strictly, in no uncertain terms. <laughs> he was very uh, clear about this, that no man should know it. Why did Jesus do this from our previous studies? He didn't want people fall on him for miracles. That's right, for earthly uh, king or kingdom purposes. He wasn't there to set up an earthly kingdom. Uh, and there was already a, a vast majority of the Jews that were looking for the Messiah to set up an earthly kingdom, and this would just fuel that fire, add fuel to that fire. So he didn't want to be taken as a worldly king. You know, it's amazing. I was at a dance last night. We belonged to a ballroom dance club and had a dance last night. And I got into a discussion with a man who I knew was a Christian, not a Lutheran, and somehow we got in, he, he brought up the, uh, all the prophecies in the Bible about the millennium. He is a millennialist. Uh, and I argued with him for about five minutes, and I just couldn't get through to him at all, bringing up Bible verses that he just kind of blew away. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he believes that Jesus will set up an earthly kingdom. 
for a thousand years yet to come. But Jesus never mentioned anything like this. He said just the opposite. My kingdom is not of this world. So he didn't come to be a worldly king. This, this world was not heaven and never would be heaven again. Uh, so we shouldn't look for it here. Uh, and Oh, it's just like it just bounced, bounced like a rubber ball off a brick wall. <laughs> All he could bring up was Revelation and Daniel. <laughs> he said, those are visions. You're taking them literally, and they're just visions. It's numerology. Oh, no, it says seven weeks here, and... <laughs> and I says, well, I don't agree with you. He says, well, I took a class on it. <laughs> that was his big, I just took a class. <laughs> well, you can take a class in anything. Does that make it true? <laughs> so anyway, I didn't want to argue with him, so I just finally ended it. But this is, you know, people today still look for an earthly kingdom, that Jesus is going to reign on earth. Well, he does reign on earth. He is king. Yeah, he rules the earth, but not in the way of an earthly king. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he rules the wind and the waves. We saw that at the end of chapter 4. Uh, he rules uh, death and all diseases and everything else. He rules all things, but not sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. <laughs> okay? Let's go back to chapter 1. In Mark, and uh, this isn't something new that we're reading here to the end of chapter 5. Uh, Jesus there uh, heals a leper. Okay? It begins in verse 40 uh, a leper came to him, Jesus heals him. Then verse 44 and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man. Okay? Uh, and then verse 44. 45, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more what? Yeah, so he had to stay outside the city. See, it would hinder his work because people would uh, try to interfere with his work, trying to force him onto an earthly pedestal. In chapter 3, we saw the same thing, if you recall. Go to chapter 3, verse 7. Mark 3, 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, the Sea of Galilee. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. You see how fast the word is spread? <laughs> he knows that just out of this, this little group of six people in this girl's room, this is going to spread like wildfire if he's, he can raise the dead. Verse, uh, I'll go on to verse 8. A great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, did what? Came, came unto him. They came from far and wide. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should what? Yeah, just forcefully uh, start grabbing him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And many unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. <laughs> it's hindering his work that he came to do. So that's why he says this. We're going to see it again in chapter 7, if you go forward to chapter 7 in Mark. Chapter 7, verse 36, he heals a deaf and dumb man here. And then verse 36, and he charged them that they should tell no man. But look what happens. 
but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. Disobedience to God, that's all over the place, because we're all sinful. So they, they, they don't do what he commands, but still he commands it. Go to chapter 9 in Mark. Verse 9. This is right after the Mount of Transfiguration. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them, the apostles, that they should tell no man what things they had seen until the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Then they could tell it. That's why they could write it in the Bible. We have the New Testament. But his work was done then. All what was left by then was to ascend back to heaven uh, visibly. But before that, that would hinder his work if they told the people about this transfiguration. They actually tried to do this once. If you go to the Gospel of John, John 6, I'll pick it up at verse 2. John 6, verse 2. And a great multitude followed him. Because, why? They saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now this mountain, by the way, on your map, is east of the Sea of Galilee. That's a mountainous area. Galilee itself, which is west of the Sea of Galilee, is a, is a flat area. So no mountains there over to the Mediterranean Sea. But, but east, that's a mountainous region. Uh, that pink area. And uh, so he went over there to, in effect, try to get away from the crowds, to go up on this mountain with his disciples, the apostles. And verse 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. 5, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Okay, so even though he's trying to get away from the crowds for a little while, they're still following him. They follow him out into this mountainous region. They're coming up the mountain. You know, coming, looking for him in the mountain. And he says to Philip, one of the apostles, um, how can we buy bread for these, this great multitude to eat? Because, you know, you're out in a wilderness area here, far from any civilization where there'd be food. Six, and this he said to prove him, test his faith, for he himself knew what he would do. What's he going to do? What did he know he was going to do? That's right. He's going to produce the food out of nothing. Being God, he can do that. But he's testing Philip's faith to see what Philip says. Is Philip going to say, well, Jesus, you can, you're God. You can produce food. Well, Philip answers him in verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Did he pass the test of faith? No, he's still worldly. He's still thinking only in terms of money. 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? It's like nothing. That's nothing. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about, whoa, 5,000. That's a lot of people. And Jesus took the loaves that this little lad had, and when he had given thanks, he still thanked God for it. We should thank God for our food every time we eat, even if it not be a banquet. Whatever it is, thank him for it. He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as many as they would. When they were filled, all 5,000 plus of the people in this big crowd were not only fed, they were fed full. They couldn't eat anymore. He said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments 
that remain, that nothing be lost. There is even more left over than he started with. They, they'd eaten all they could. They didn't want any more. And there was still a lot left over. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets, just like the 12 apostles, with fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above them that had eaten. A miracle? A miracle only God could do? Yep. Why, if people could do that, we wouldn't have to farm anymore, would we? (laughs) Wouldn't have to have any farms, wouldn't have to have any food processing plants, wouldn't have to have grocery stores. Obviously, man cannot do this. Only God can do this, create things out of nothing. 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, way out here in the middle of nowhere, he produces this huge amount of food. Uh, What did they say? This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him what? A king, see? That's that's what he knew they would be doing all the time. The more this word got out, especially that he can raise the dead. Not only can he produce great amounts of food out of nothing, miraculously he can raise the dead. So he says, uh, don't tell anybody. Don't spread this word. Until he rises from the dead. Uh, Can you imagine uh, if the word got out, not only can he heal every man of disease, he can now also raise the dead. What will people be doing? Yeah, bringing their dead relatives' bodies to him. (laughs) Or asking him to come to the cemeteries or the tombs. So why did he perform this miracle? Why did he do it at all then? Yeah, to show to who? The apostles. Why the apostles? They were the ones, that, that's why they were chosen. He chose these 12 men to be his eyewitnesses, but only them. But the word gets out anyway. Okay, so that's human nature. They don't obey him. It is only to be known by all the world after Jesus himself rises from the dead. He was already being thronged by great multitudes just because the word got out that he could heal the sick. It can only be imagined that some would now come seeking resurrection for their loved ones. But obviously this did not work. If you go back to Matthew chapter 9, which is the parallel account of this, It doesn't say it in Mark, but it says it in Matthew. What was the result of it? Uh, You see uh, see in Matthew 9, 25, you see where he takes the damsel by, the the girl by the hand, and uh, she arose. But then look at the next verse, 26, and the fame hereof went abroad into all that land, despite his command. Well, isn't that the way it is always? God gives his commands, but who obeys them? (laughs) You you, you see gross uh, disobedience to God's command all over the place. Who's the only people who care about what God commands? The Christians, yeah. But look at all the young, they don't care what God commands. It has nothing to do with their life. God can command it all he wants, but they ignore it. Just like here. Okay. That's why we have to have governments, by the way. (laughs) Governments are supposed to keep people in line. Uh, God gives his commands, and that doesn't keep them in line. So he puts governments over them to forcibly keep them in line. But anyway... uh, So then what does he do? Going back to Mark 6, 43, what's the last phrase in this chapter? Yeah, commanded, uh, another commandment here, commanded that 
something should be given her to eat. Now, why did he do this? Well, first of all, that's a good detail added here, isn't it? Peter's the eyewitness, the authority behind Mark, dictating it to his assistant Mark, and he remembers this very vividly, even though it's years later. And he remembers, not only did he, Jesus take her by the hand, I remember the exact words he spoke, I remember she got up and walked around, and then I remember the astonishment of the people, and I remember he then commanded something to give in this girl to eat. Of course, the Holy Ghost brought all this memory back to him and inspired him to record it for us today. But uh, one, one lesson we get from that, look, look at the thoughtfulness of Jesus. Look at the love of Jesus. First of all, that's, that's the first lesson I get from that phrase. He's concerned about her eating. Uh, he has almighty power. He's God. He's God almighty. He raises the dead easily, effortlessly. It's nothing to him to raise the dead. And yet, he is not so great that he's not concerned about the detail of our minute-by-minute -minute life in this world and our needs that we have every moment. He is great, but he is also concerned about the small things, our daily need for food. Uh, we saw that a moment ago in John, didn't we, when he fed the 5,000. He was concerned about their need for food. He knows we need food. Uh, Jesus talked about God feeds the birds, the billions of birds in the world. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not of much more value than a bird? Let's go to chapter 6 for a moment. Chapter 6, let's pick it up at verse 34 there. A little bit of looking ahead here to chapter 6. This is really a parallel passage probably to the John passage we read a moment ago. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with what? Compassion for them. This is concern and care and love toward them, toward their needs because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. How long would sheep last without a shepherd? Not very long, they'd get lost, they'd fall off cliffs, they'd wander into uh, places where there was no food and water, and they'd get lost right away, or get attacked by wild animals. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Okay. The disciples are throwing up their hands like, uh, there's too many people, this is a desert. Uh, there's really no place they can be, go to get food. But that's, that's, they wash their hands of it that way. Well, they'll send them away, they'll, they'll find it somehow. 37, he answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Sound familiar? That's what we just read in John. He saith unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say five and two fishes. He commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed. He thanked <clears throat> and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all, and they all did eat and were filled. He didn't just give them barely enough to get by. Uh, God can give infinite amounts of great things to anybody whenever he wants to. 
And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes, and they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. All because of verse 34, he was moved with compassion toward them. He was concerned about something so mundane as food. Now, do you think Jesus watches over you? Sure he does. He knows you every second. He knows everything you need, and he can supply it all. And he wants you to look to him and thank him for it. Let's go also to, uh, back to Matthew. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. This is where Jesus uh, teaches us the uh, Lord's Prayer. What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread, verse 11. Uh, It's the only petition of the Lord's Prayer that concerns earthly things. So we include all, you know, in our catechism when we learn the the, uh, uh, Lord's Prayer. This is the only petition that, that concerns earthly temporal needs. And the rest are all spiritual needs that he teaches us to pray for. But this one, he doesn't leave it out. Pray to God for all your physical needs too. But look at verse eight. Right before he teaches you the Lord's Prayer, he says, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So why does he want us to pray to him? Why does he want us to ask? To remind ourselves where it's gonna come from. It's a teaching mechanism for us to pray. Go down to verse 31 in that same chapter of Matthew. Jesus says, this is the uh, verse I quoted a moment ago about the the birds of the air. He, he, He finishes, 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. What are the Gentiles? Yeah, the non-Christians. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He certainly knows all your needs. 33, but seek ye first, if you're going to seek something, top priority, seek first, what? Kingdom of God. How do you do that? That's what you're doing right now. You're going into his word. You're seeking God and his kingdom. And his righteousness, not your righteousness, his righteousness that he gives you through Christ Jesus. And then all these other things, food, drink, clothing, whatever, earthly things, all these things shall be added unto you. They'll be taken care of. If you seek first his kingdom, this is his promise. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing that we do. Start the week off right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it gets our minds and souls in the right frame of mind. And it, as we go through the week every day, we dip back into his word for daily guidance and daily bread. Let's go to the Old Testament. See it uh, on display there. Uh, go to Exodus. And we know about Exodus that, uh, you know, we just studied Genesis and we left off the children of Israel in Egypt at the end of Exodus uh, under Joseph's uh, great uh, power. They were brought to Egypt, all 73 or four or whatever of the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that time. They're all in Egypt enjoying a, a land of Goshen, a great uh, Delta region there, and everything's going fine. But as the years pass and Joseph dies uh, and the Pharaoh dies that knew him, uh, as years go on, uh, other Pharaohs come come around and and they start oppressing the Jews, the Israelites in Goshen, and they end up slaves. So hundreds of years have passed between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. And in that 400 year period, 
uh, the Israelites are still in Egypt, but they're not doing so good now. Now they're being uh, persecuted, basically, uh, killed and made slaves. So we pick it up in chapter 3, and verse 7, and what is God doing in that 400 years? Is he forgetting his chosen people? Did he, well, I mean, they're falling into, into dire straits, and uh, God not aware of this? He's aware of it. Look at verse 7. He's talking to Moses now, who has escaped from Egypt. And he's over in Sinai, uh, shepherding sheep. And the Lord God appears. By the way, this is God the Son, who will become Jesus. Uh, Verse 7, And the Lord, Jehovah, said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. He's seen it. He's certainly aware of it. It's not that God is ignoring it. And have heard their cry, their prayers, by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, that's food, unto the place of the Canaanites, and so forth. God is aware of our needs, and if we're suffering, he's aware of it, especially of his people, his chosen people. Then go to the book of Deuteronomy, which is after they have been led out of Egypt, miraculously under God's hand and Moses' leadership. Deuteronomy chapter 2, And you know how God delivered them from that uh, bad situation in Egypt, don't you? By many, many miracles. The ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and so forth. All the miracles in Sinai. Pick it up in uh, Deuteronomy 2. Look at verse 6. They are on their way to the promised land of Canaan, which God had promised to Abraham and his descendants. We now call it Israel. Uh, And they have to go by an area that had been given, if you look at the context preceding this, that had gone to the children of Esau. You know who Esau was from our study of Genesis. That's Jacob's brother. Well, he had been given some land there, but they have to kind of go through that land to get to Canaan. And uh, as they pass through that land, what does God say to them in verse 5? Meddle not with them. Uh, don't mingle with your shirt tail relatives here, the Edomites. For I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breath, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for possession, his descendants. But look at six. Ye shall buy meat of them for money. In other words, as you pass through there, You'll give them some of your gold and stuff that you took from Egypt, and you'll buy your food. Now, you see, God's concerned about your food. He knows that as they pass through the, through the desert of Sinai for 40 years, they need what? They need food and water. So he gives them manna every morning and water from rocks. He knows our needs. He made sure that their, their clothes didn't wear out in 40 years. So they had what they needed to get get along in this world by God's blessing. And so he says, I'm concerned about your food. And as you go through the land, buy food with the money. In verse 6, that ye may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money, that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand, He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast what? Lacked nothing. nothing. And that's God's promise to you as Christians, Christ believers. 
You will lack nothing in this world. He'll always be with you and give you exactly what you need. But he don't want to give you too much because then what happens? Well, not only lazy, but you'll forget God. You'll forget who gives you all these things. And you'll start thinking, oh, I don't need God anymore. I got all this stuff for myself. That's exactly what happens all through the history of the Bible. Israel, when they prospered, forsook the Lord. And he had to chasten them. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalm 145. And here's something that Martin Luther uh, advised us to use in our daily prayers, especially when we sit down to eat. Psalm 145, verse 15. Psalm 145, 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Uh, This is, uh, of course, God. Everybody's eyes look to God for food. Now, whether they they do it or not, that's where their food's coming from, is what that means. Everybody's food comes from God. They wait for him to give them their food. Most people don't believe that, but it's true. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou, God, givest them their meat that's food, in due season, at the right time. Thou, God, openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. Everybody's food, not only human beings, but the animals and the insects, the birds, every living thing is fed by God. God knows we need food, and he promises to give it. The eyes of all wait upon him. Okay, so getting back to Mark 5, the last verse. Jesus, after he has raised the girl up and she's walking around, he says, give her something to eat. First of all, it shows his compassion. It shows his Uh, concern for our daily needs, our needs of our body. Uh, But it also is further proof that she is what? Totally healed. Totally restored to life. Normal life. She needs food now. Now maybe when she was really deathly sick, she had no appetite. But now she wants to eat. So uh, she has complete restoration to bodily life here. Let's go to Luke 24 for a minute. It's 10.04, we won't go to Luke. You can look at it at home, Luke 24, beginning at verse 36, and you can read it for yourself. See how that applies to this situation. Let's close with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.